Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox and thanks for logging on. This is Watches Tonight. This evening I discuss concerns about full disclosure. A new watch arrives and I talk all about it. We chat live, I share your viewer wrist shots, and a note about a format change coming for the show. All of that tonight on Watches Tonight. But first, I want to update you on our Watchbox locations. We are opening up two locations coming in South Florida, in Boca and Miami, plus Los Angeles. And, spoiler alert, we are going on tour in Singapore and Hong Kong to contact about appointments at any of those locations or to join our world tour of Debitun and Jorn in East Asia, reach out to us through the locations page at thewatchbox.com or if you're interested in the world tour in Hong Kong and Singapore, world tour at thewatchbox.com. All right, in the box, Robert Dixon, we have Tariq Chaudhry, we have Paolo M. from Philadelphia, Arto Charles, we have Marco B. from Firenze, the historic home of Panerai, we have Thomas, we have Jim Millett, John N., Paul Steinberg, we've got JJ from Michigan, Average Joe, 2086 from Western Massachusetts, we've got Abdul from Germany, Daniel Fisher, Zeus, Watch Pillar, joining from Munich. By the way, Watch Pillar, notice anything in the background? Today we're going to talk a little bit about that and a bunch of other free stuff that people sent me. And I can see we've got Tom H., Will Burroughs, and Lloyd K. Welcome, guys. Welcome all. Join me on Instagram, by the way. I want to emphasize that if you want to learn about the watch that I'm going to be showing you tonight, there is a little preview down at the bottom center. That's the Mr. Roboto in bronze. But check me out because these 60-second reviews are often the best watches we've got here at the Watch Box. It's not the broad brush with which I paint on YouTube. It is a much finer focus on the stuff that excites me. Okay, viewer wrist shots number one. I asked, you answered. David F. in his FP Journ Chronomet Bleu braved the cold in his Tesla Model Y. Yukai is in Hong Kong, we're going there, with an Audemars Piguet Royal Oak Offshore bought from Watchbox Hong Kong. And yes, we are in Hong Kong. Nick M. of Alabama prepares for Christmas with his Vacheron Constantin overseas dual time. And Ken O. of the Philippines shares a Patek Philippe 5056P annual calendar that he bought from Watchbox. To all who buy from Watchbox, Thank you for trusting our company. Finally, Eric O and his Rolex Daytona are in the holiday spirit in Napa, California. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your pieces on these pixels. We've got Watch You Are from Zurich joining in. We've got Edward Ledden of Sweden. We've got Alexi Simola of Finland. A Mick in Florida. Guess where he's from? We've got Jean Claude Beaver. Beaver, not be there. And Ben S. who's joining in, watching live with my Zin on the wrist. And then we've got Minibus 1351 Cartier or Reverso. Why not split the difference and go with a Cartier Basculante? All right, jumping into our regularly scheduled program. Disclosure online and reliable sources. Here's the thing guys, the internet is full of salesmen pitching products and services. Some of them are obvious and some of them may be a little bit less so. For example, the custom skateboard behind me, you can see it right there, is a gift from Jacob at Real Collection times Diaper Book Club. Yes, that's what it's called, Real Collection with Diaper Book Club, but it's a lovely DB28 Debitoon on a skateboard base. Very cool, and that's kind of benign as gifts go because, let's face it, that doesn't cost tens of thousands of dollars. But half-truths and omissions are as bad as lies, so I want to be clear that people are sending me free stuff, and they have been for a really long time. Uh, so it's probably 2019 that the first trickle of gifts started showing up from people asking for nothing but promotion and reciprocity on my platforms. So let's take a look at what I mean in practical terms. Lemmy, legendarily of Motorhead, once commented on the irony that once he started making real money after a few decades of Motorhead, people suddenly wanted to give him all the stuff he could now afford to buy. And I'm getting to that more every day. So all of the stuff on my set, was sent to me by people who either wanted to give me a token of their appreciation or realize some level of reciprocity. So things that were not ever intended to be seen publicly. That skateboard and the Porsche. So the Porsche off to my left shoulder, 
I guess you're right, was a gift from Aaron Bazarkanian of Havid Nagan Watches, because I did a review of his watch when he was launching his brand, and he was very kind enough to send me that Lego Porsche Targa or Turbo. You can build it either way, depending on your preference. And then, of course, Jacob sent me that lovely skateboard with the DB28 on it, which is really cool. You can not actually buy that, so again, there's not a whole lot of reciprocity asked. It's just a cool thing to enjoy. Um, but now some other things, like this jacket and this jacket were both for free from the Armory, and the one I'm wearing was tailored, so they obviously spent some time and money on that. Also, behind me, you can see Watch Pillar, which is a watch display case that came from Germany, and it's really, really nice. They even customized it with Watchbox logos. But again, it's the kind of thing where I'm going to do a review on this out of gratitude, but I also want you guys to know that it's something I got for free. Also important to note, that clock behind the Watch Pillar. You guys have often commented on this occasionally spastic and fantastic Nixie clock, which Dalibor Farney sent me from the Czech Republic. And then there are two watches on my wrist that people sent me for free. They're wonderful folks, but I want to be open about this because when a watch person buys a watch and then goes on social media and talks about it, you should know whether or not he bought it with his own money and whether he would buy it with his own money. So here's my red line. No, not red line. My red line that I will not cross. When I'm asked to promote or acknowledge a product that I receive for free, I will always be upfront about it. So you can decide whether or not you believe what I'm saying. Because, let's face it, you can make what you want of my opinion, but I'll never approach a product assessment without disclosing who provided it and where it came from. And when it's the watch box, the watch box is where I work. Everyone understands that I'm an online watch salesman for a company that sells pre-owned watches and indirectly via Debitune a couple of new ones. Um, all that crazy hardware that I handle on YouTube comes from my employer, and there's no real moral hazard there because it's straightforward, a salesman making a pitch. That leaves me in a no man's land when an external product shows up in gift form because you have no way of knowing who besides Watchbox is regularly hooking me up with stuff. And unlike Watchbox watches, a lot of these gifts have the outward appearance of being my personal property, or they even are now my personal property. So I'm going to pledge that any third-party gift that is sent to me for exposure here or on my social media is disclosed as a gift. Again, this is not like government. This is not like financial disclosure. There are all sorts of ethical compunctions, both statutory and conventional and customary that apply there. This is a weird online gray area. Since a lot of this stuff that I'm getting is expensive, I'll also try to comment on whether I'd buy it with my own money if given the chance. Now let's jump in. We've got Dylan Lamb in the chat box, Stagecoach 420. We've got Watches with Dennis saying, I've thought about making a Nixie tube clock as a project, but I always fail to find the motivation. There's a new one that you can actually buy that's a wristwatch. I saw that at the GPHG. There was an evening event where we actually voted, and I think it was like Gel Golfman or Gelfman. It was a really cool thing, um, but because it's made in Russia, I don't know how available it actually is right now. What else is going on? We've got Geezer. Greetings from Londres. Thank you so much. We've got Anthony Napolitano. We've got Time Hill and Jem Hader joining from Belgium, staying up late with us in Central Europe and Northern Europe. You guys are the best who are staying up late, sometimes super late to the point that it's actually early in the next morning in the Middle East. What else is going on? We have Whole Milk saying, I'll take your armory jacket so you won't be ethically compromised. And then right, I appreciate that. That's kind. Only a friend would do that. We have Scott Wexlin just tuning in from Westchester, Pennsylvania, asking, what is on Tim's wrist? A new watch, and I'm going to talk all about it in a moment. We've got Ghulam joining from Kashmir. I featured his wrist shot about a week ago. That was a very cool one. I appreciated all the stuff you sent, even though I could only feature one of the photos. We've got Pappy from Toronto joining in, and Jesse Rowland from Ferndale, Michigan. All right, we got Tolgasen. I just bought a Snoopy from Watchbox today. Thank you for trusting our folks and our company. We got Sarah joining in from the UK, another one of our late night crew. Okay, wrist shots number two. Makal B of Poland. 
pilots his newly arrived Lexus NX with his Breitling Aerospace Evo. Nice comparison. Troy B. is in Washington, D.C. with his Rolex Submariner at the National Christmas Tree. Actually, they got everything there. They've got the monuments, they've got a menorah, they've got the Christmas tree, all lit up for the holidays. We've got Kevin D. in his Grand Seiko Spring Drive 5-Day White Birch preparing for a dinner of omakase, which I anticipate would be delicious. And then we've got Shaked O. Oh, who visits the Morgan Library with his Tudor Ranger. Nate T. Looks back to Thanksgiving in Maui with his Omega Seamaster Aquaterra. Sometimes the backdrop matters more than the wrist shot. I love when you guys do cool locations and backdrops, even if you can't get the watch in focus. It's always a pleasure. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your wrist on my list. We've got Kesslowitz joining from Los Angeles. We've got BZ from Beverly Hills, Michigan. We've got Hans N joining in. And we've got Full Metal Luke from Chalfont, Pennsylvania. All right, guys, so what about my new watch? Now that I've teased it, there it is right there. If you want to see the full-length review and unboxing, you can pause me, because you're probably watching me recorded. Statistically, you are. Head over to Watchbox Reviews, check out the full-length unboxing wrist shots and watch review. It was my first ever unboxing video, and there will be many more, but that was one hell of a way to start. So let me give you some background on how this developed. Azimuth watches was actually founded in 2003 out of Singapore by a couple of watch enthusiasts. Chris Young, co-founder then, owner today, was one of them. He's an engineer by trade, but he wanted to create Swiss watches that were built to, let's say, an engineer's sensibility of what would be cool. So he had an idea of watches along the lines of the Erwerks of the world. Later on, we'd come to associate this kind of extravagant machine age styling with Grubel 4C, Debetun, Nordzeit machine, and MBNF. But the idea was to do that kind of look at a more accessible price point. So interesting things, they like to focus on sci-fi, they like to focus on space and automotive, all of these things in extravagantly elaborated interpretive form, which is how you get a 1950s robot doing business as a wristwatch right here. So again, think Erwerk, Nordzeit machine, MBNF, Debetun, Grubel 4C, or even Richard Meal, but for a lot less money. Now, Chris was talking to a mutual friend of ours, a journalist, Adi Soon, out of Singapore, who's been writing about watches for years. And somehow I came up, and Chris decided to send me a Mr. Roboto Bronzo Artist series on basically an indefinite loan, so keep it if you like it, and a review. So that's how it came to be on my wrist today. My unboxing and evaluation video includes all those impressions. So again, if you do want to see the full experience you'd get if you actually bought it and opened the packaging and the warranty card and the instruction manual, you can see all of that there. But what is it? Well, here you get a better view of my exact watch. So Mr. Roboto, as a watch, started as a concept back in 2008. And back then, the idea was take a 1950s robot toy called Lantern Robot, it was actually from Japan at the time, and build a wristwatch that incorporates what they liked most about the Lantern Robot. So 2017 brought a larger R2 model, if you have a truly huge wrist, and a limited edition Bronzo model in bronze for the Hong Kong market. 2022 brought the Artist Series, and that's what I have. And as you can see, there are several different engraved motifs on the Artist Series. It's in the R1, the original smaller Mr. Roboto case, so you get a sense of the size. And then it has all this hand engraving split across a couple of different themes. It arrived on my desk, and if we can go back to the full screen right here, you can see exactly what I'm talking about. But it arrived on my desk aggressively crypto-themed. Taking a quick look, we'll go clockwise from the upper, from what would be like 11 o'clock. So at 11 o'clock, you can see a rocket ship, Bitcoin symbols, and the moon symbolizing, it's a rebus for to the moon, which was up until recently thought to be the direction of Bitcoin. And then you can see moving down the three o'clock side, there's some Bitcoin symbols, symbols of electronic payment, decentralized finance. You get to the bottom and there's a lot of microchip integrated circuitry type imagery. And then right about where seven o'clock would be, you've got the image of a bull because it was once thought that Bitcoin was on an infinite bull run. And so you've got all this crypto, DeFi, and 
shall we say, optimistic, bullish sentiment. But they are not all like this. This probably would not have been my call if I were choosing from among the artist series. But again, I got this for free. So I also dig it in an ironic sense because just as this was the 1950s notion of what a robot would look like, and it turned out to be nothing like today's dust-sucking domestic hockey pucks. Uh, it's fun that it's also got the Bitcoin imagery, because that might turn out to be our era's false vision of what the future holds. Remember, this is a very Rosie the Robot from the Jetsons view of robot's future. So who knows, maybe Bitcoin and crypto will seem very dated, but 2020s cool in 30 years from now. So what do you get if you, well, <laughs> here's the thing. Let me diverge for a second. Do you get the idea that the up other crypto shoe is kind of like waiting to fall? Like, think about it this way. In, in terms of the last major recession, could it be that FTX is actually this economy's Bear Stearns, like the first sign of serious trouble, albeit a few months out from the real crash, and maybe Binance is waiting in the wings to become the Lehman Brothers moment for the current economy when things got real, real fast. That was the Lehman crash. And, you know, for the summer of 2008, a lot of folks were saying, well, we're past the worst of it. Bear Stearns was just poorly capitalized. Lehman was a lot bigger and a lot more integral to the financial system. And frankly, so is Binance bigger and more integral to the financial system. We shall see. What are their Binance finances like? Who knows? It's completely opaque. But they say they're well capitalized and everything's properly insured. I see no reason to doubt them. Okay, what else is going on? Well, okay, I digress. You can get the artist series in many forms from Azimuth, and there are different themes available, including the Memento Mori, which I don't know, it's never been my thing, but when they're artistically and handsomely rendered, I can be reminded of imminent impending death and still enjoy the experience. But if you like Memento Mori watches, they've got a couple of themes in the artist series. And they also have mechanical mayhem. So if you're a general gears and sprocket type guy, you have as much fun on the outside of the watch as you have on the inside of the watch. And they even have Azimuth's take on the immortal Swatch Bunny Sutra, but I cannot show you that one lest this video be somehow censored by YouTube itself. Put it this way, type in Bunny Sutra Swatch on Google, you will find more than you want to find. That said, the engravings are freehand executed in each instance, which means unlike, say, laser cut or drill bit engraving, this is the real deal. So if you can't afford a Linda Verdelin octopus tattoo or a Patek Philippe 5160, this is a great way to get the same experience for a lot less money. And that's sort of the azimuth motto. Take something cool from a much more expensive watch and make it accessible at a lower price point. Months, apparently were required to create the bare handful of these that were made available, and I don't think they made more than 12, 8 to 12, so these are fairly scarce. The particular bronze chosen by Azimuth plays almost like rose gold with deeply red undertones, and if you look at that, you can see how that could easily be mistaken for 5N rose or red gold. And it's my understanding that this is due to the particularly high copper content of their German-sourced bronze for this watch. So not only does it produce a much darker and more intensely colored bronze, but it portends radical patination down the line. Unlike the nearly yellow bronze used most notably by Tudor and others, this rose-like azimuth is gonna go full Titanic rather quickly. So I'm kind of excited to see where this goes, but as long as it doesn't change my wrist to blue or green tones, or teal, which I guess is sort of between the two. I'm cool with it. It will be an adventure and the watch will become even more unique than it is. And if you want a truly controversial robot watch, Azimuth has that covered too. That is Mr. Roboto full pave. Yes, steel and diamond paved. So if you thought Bitcoin was controversial, giddy up. Okay, wrist shots number three. Let's see what you guys are saying in the box here. Before we jump to wrist shots, we have Oh, a lot of comments on the crypto. We got Ryan G saying, traveling in the US and got to make the live stream today. Hey, Tim. Hey, Ryan. Good to see you there. We've got Stagecoach420 saying, Bioshock is right. And uh, Simon Holt saying that Azimuth is very Bioshock. You know, it really is. That's a good way. I didn't think of it that way, but 
I, I guess Bioshock is more like diesel punk than steampunk. So yeah, I guess you could say that this is like 1930s like diesel punk. That's a great way to put it. John H. saying, love the OG Mr. Roboto. I would like a special edition vinyl copy of Styx to go with it. By the way, if you didn't know that the original song was from a rock opera, you would never have guessed what it's actually about. It's about a guy escaping a prison using the metal exoskeleton of a robot guard that he overwhelmed and gutted. Would you have ever guessed it was that? No, I would have thought it was like an early 80s tribute to the far-reaching influence of Japanese pop culture on America, but apparently it has nothing to do with that. I was disappointed. Nevertheless, cultural literacy, I've improved. Okay, what else is going on? We have James F. saying, it's interesting but so big, more on that in a moment. And a question, Matt Parker, wonder how much Azimuth paid for this advertising? I'll tell you, the watch costs about $10,000 and they gave it to me for free, now you know. Like I said, full disclosure, I have nothing to hide. But I am reviewing a watch that I decided to keep because I really do like it. So if you want to know how I earnestly feel about it, continue to watch. What else is going on here in the box? BM, Tim, Nomos Orion or Tudor 1926 in terms of quality. I've heard Nomos quality can be, can be kind of hit and miss. Like I've seen some, some movements that came back over oiled and poorly uh, gem set and like things that from their early manufacture movement era had me a little bit worried. I have no doubts about the Tudor, but I would say recent production Nomos Orion, you're probably fine. And there's probably a little bit more option in terms of colors of dials and colors of straps. What else is going on? Chuck P, Tim, thoughts on the new Moser Genesis? Not really my thing. Take everything you didn't like about the Bulgari Octo Finissimo Ultimate with the NFT on the dial, and now make it more so, and you've got the Moser Genesis. It's a cool idea, but it's not for me. And then right here we have Marcus saying, 10 grand buys Tim for 30 minutes, better than my pay rate. It's not gonna be all that, but again, it's not too often that I get a new watch. I don't get to talk about this too often, guys. You buy new watches more often than I get new watches. Viewer wrist shots, number three. Okay, Roland of Michigan enjoys cappuccino with his Grand Seiko snowflake. Ryan G, had a chance to sample a rare Debatoon DB5 in steel. That is very cool right there. You don't see too many of those. Debatoon rarely works in steel. Harry B, maintains the Cartier tradition with his Santos Dumont XL. Looking good right there. And Edward B, thinks differently with the Gerard Perigo Laureato 42. Mark R of New Zealand shares a rare Tag Heuer Aqua Racer Solar Graph. Guys, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your wrist on my list. Okay, what's going on here? Rusty T, would you spend 10,000 on it? No. I would probably buy the standard Mr. Roboto for like six grand because frankly a $4,000 premium to get the exact same machine to me is more than I would pay. I would say if I were to pay 10 grand for the artist series, I would want to have it custom engraved with my choice of imagery, which means I would probably want like race cars and things that I think are cool. And you know, that would probably be my choice. I, I would want it to be a little bit more bespoke. I probably wouldn't want some off the shelf crypto or memento mori. As cool as some of the themes are, I would really want it to be very personal because an engraved watch is by definition always gonna be unique. You can never exactly engrave the same patterns twice. So if it's gonna be unique, it may as well be very personal and bespoke. And I'm willing to bet that for that kind of money, 10 grand, you could probably get it done that way. And then we have a question from Tobister McDonkey. All right, uh, Mr. McDonkey, what will you buy for your next watch, Timbo? The freebies are awesome, but where would you put your dollars? Uh, here's the thing, I'm kind of an all or nothing type guy where I would really love to own a Patek Philippe 5236P. The problem is they're 100 grand and Brian Govberg's not giving me any discounts. So that would be my, my first choice. That's what I'd really like to own. Now, in terms of watches that don't cost as much as a Midwestern house, I still love the Magneto S from Ball. I still love the MIH watch. And with a new version, a somewhat more usable version of the MIH watch in production, I might be looking at that. But I gotta admit, I kinda like Devon Treads. And as weird and offensive as they are to the sensibility of a traditional mechanical watch fan, I could very easily see myself wearing a Tread 1F or maybe a Tread 2 Motown Knights. So there we go. Mark K, folks, annual calendar versus perpetual calendar, worth the extra dollars. Well, it depends. There's some truly great perpetual calendars out there, 
and there are some truly great annual calendars. If we're talking like a 5235 G Patek Philippe versus like a Frédéric Constant perpetual calendar, get the Patek Philippe. But if we're talking something like a Patek Philippe, you know, 5036 annual calendar moon phase versus a, I don't know, let's say 3940 or something from Patek Philippe, you know, you have to take the price into account but then you also have to take servicing costs into account. And it's a lot cheaper to service a completely wheel-based annual calendar than it is to service a wheel and lever-based perpetual calendar, especially since sometimes when a perpetual calendar from Patek goes back together, a little bit of filing and shimming and tailoring is necessary. It's not as simply as rebuilding the, it's not as simple as rebuilding the Legos. So just take that into account. Servicing them is something to consider. Now there are some wonderful perpetual calendars out there, but there are also some annual calendars that are absolutely bonkers. I always loved the FP Journe Calendrier, which was a five-day power reserve, automatic winding, retrograde date, and annual calendar. And I actually like it quite a bit more than the later Octa Calendrier, which was a wonderful watch, but as a perpetual calendar, it didn't have the action factor of the retrograde, which I love. And I just didn't fall in love with the, the dial of the basically the later Journe Perpetual Calendar. I liked the annual calendar dial better. I thought it was more beautiful. So a lot of times you're going to go on the basis of how the dial looks. And dial layout is probably the single greatest factor in your decision to buy a watch on aesthetics. Lugs are important for aesthetics, but they're really important for fit and ergonomics. Whereas the dial is almost always the make or break factor when you buy a watch. So don't buy a watch telling yourself that it's the right price or it is the right complication or that you got a great value. Get the watch that you really like because it looks right. Because look, I don't agree with FP Journe on everything, but he says he designs his dials before any other part of the watch. Because if the dial doesn't look good, what's the point? And I agree. Okay, what else is going on here? Eric Nielsen saying the original MIH designer and Horological Museum charity coordinator have both disavowed the new MIH. Well, that doesn't bother me at all. And I'll tell you why, because Gerald Genta also disavowed the Royal Oak Offshore because he called it a perversion. And to be perfectly honest, I like a lot of offshores. So just because the revolutionary has become the establishment doesn't mean I'm necessarily going to side with that opinion. And the MIH watch was a breakthrough. But if you remember the MIH 2, the Gaia, which was a total sellout of the name, cheaply made, but to be honest, appropriately priced. It was so much less interesting than the original that if I had a choice between that and the reborn MIH chronograph annual calendar, I'm obviously paying more to get the chronograph annual calendar because it's just a more interesting watch. So yes, I, I guess it was Christian Gaffner was the original designer, like the aesthetic designer. He can disown it, but I still like the watch and that's the basis for my decision ultimately. What else is going on here? Adam Crossfire saying the dial is the reason I haven't bought a moon watch yet. Probably Probably my favorite case shape of any watch. Love the history, but find the dial boring. Your answer is the caliber 1866 and the moon watch moon phase with the date. That is the one to get. That's a much more exciting dial. And the several different upscale luxurious versions, including with silver white dials, blue hands, and white gold bezels. So definitely check that out. Caliber 1866, moon watch moon phase. What else is going on here? Okay. And BM saying thanks for these great chats and happy holidays. I appreciate that, BM. The show is going to become much more interactive very soon, and I'm going to tell you about that a little bit later on today because the format is going to change and it's changing soon. What else is going on here? We've got Jay Reynolds saying, My nerdy math genius daughter wants me to buy a Mr. Roboto so she can inherit it when I croak. You know, that's a common reason people ask elder relatives to buy cars and fashion and watches and real estate. It's amazing how many people are just waiting for you to die, uh, which is why I'm leaving everything to my friend. And he doesn't know I'm leaving it all to him. So my, my family knows I'm leaving them nothing. And my friend doesn't know he's the beneficiary. So no one's going to kill me. That's the idea right there. What else is going on? 
M. Pesh saying, Tim, don't pump the Moonwatch moon face. I'm trying to save for one. You know what? I don't have that kind of pull. This isn't Hodinkee. I'm not John Mayer, and we're not talking watches. So I'm not going to move the market for anything we mention here. What else is going on here? Okay, let's talk a little bit more about the watch. Okay, so about the watch. What do I actually think of it? So the Mr. Roboto is a good example of how original thinking and playful style can make the most humble of running gear acceptable because it is powered by an ETA 2834, which is basically a 2824 with a, a calendar complication. So we'll talk more about that, but there's the fit issue first. At first glance, the numbers are frightening because it's 42.6 millimeters wide. It's 49.5 millimeters lug to lug, so just under 50 millimeters lug to lug, and then it's 19.5 millimeters thick. All of which is to say, you wouldn't think I could wear it, but here it is, it fits. Does it look weirdly huge? There it is on my wrist. It fits, it's narrow enough across the wrist that even without the case back curving of something like a reshared meal, it does fit quite nicely. And you can take a look here. I've got it on the set. I mean, just take a look on my wrist. It wears normally. It is very thick, though. I mean, you could see it's stacked up like a brick, but it's a reassuringly solid brick, so there is sort of a luxurious solidity to it. Just take note. It does not fit underneath the cuff. Okay, what else is going on? Well. I would say avoid the R2 unless your wrist is huge, because that one is 55 millimeters lug to lug. So is it easy to read? If you're unseasoned, no. But if you're reasonably veteran on the indie watch scene, you're probably going to get a hold of it pretty quick. So take a look. Mr. Roboto's right eye, your left, is the local time in 12-hour format. His left eye, your right, is a 24-hour format GMT second time zone. There's a little red tri-spoke where his nose would be. That's your seconds. And then there's a retrograde scale, and that's your minutes. So it's a GMT regulator dial with a retrograde. That's actually pretty impressive considering the base movement's quite simple, and it has at least three features that would be considered complications or refinements. Um, and I would say anyone can get used to it pretty quick, but what about the loom? Well, the loom is shockingly good. I would actually argue it's easier to read at night than it is to read at day. Okay, so what about warranty box and papers? Well, this is the part where I'd say go check out the unboxing so you can see what you're getting. I would say the two-year warranty is too short for something this expensive. It should be like four years at this point. And Considering the service interval of a movement like this is going to be probably five to ten years, it should be like four or five years. So that's one area where I would say they can definitely do better at Azimuth. Uh, the box and papers, they're minimalist, fairly simple. The box, the outer box for once, is the interesting part. The outer box is usually the boring part with a boxed set, but it's set up like the box for a 1950s toy and the robot on the box is actually the correct bronze color for the model, so I enjoyed it quite a bit. I also like the little warning on the box that says this is not a toy for serious collectors only. I understand that it's not a toy for kids, but it's definitely a toy for adults, and as for whether serious people spend thousands of dollars on watches, I'm not sure. I think that's almost an ironic commentary on like the watch collecting hobby itself for serious collectors only. What does it cost? Would you buy it with your own money? I would go with the standard Mr. Roboto and Steel because for me, 6,000 Swiss franc is enough. 10 grand for the bronze with the engraving, if it's not specifically my choice of engraving, is probably a bit dear. Okay, Rusty Trombone saying, what's the time, mate? Looks at watch. I have no idea. What time is it? It's a good time. That's what I like to say. What else is going on? Hans and long list of things to go wrong, hence warranty length. Not a whole lot to go wrong. It's a basic ETA base movement, but I, I do think luxury means getting more than you expect. And these days, the Rolex standard is five years, and that should lift all boats. What else is going on here? We got Norm M. Tim. I'm back in your good books if I say it's more like a TVR and not a fiberglass Excalibur. Hmm, am I back in your good books if I say it's more like a TVR and not a fiberglass Excalibur? Sure, why not? Although, confession, I actually like Excaliburs. And if you follow my podcast that I do with Kyle Lindsay, we have an interview with the woman who is Excalibur today. A woman runs the company as Camelot Classics and still does restoration parts and service. What else is going on? Gulam saying, Vianney Halter, Trio Grand Vibes from the Azimuth. Cool piece. And then James F. saying, Singapore watch companies seem to be low on warranty, even though they're making good watches. Well, remember, the watch is made in Neuchâtel, Switzerland. The company is based out of Singapore, but the watch is made in Neuchâtel. I think that's an important point of clarity. 
Okay, now, 2022, the end of an era, the beginning of a new one. So this is about the show and where the show's going in the future. By the way, I'm a shameless salesman, and I wanted to make sure you know that. And after 35 minutes, I think you get the point. So... This is going to be my last episode of Watches tonight for a while, until January 23rd, in fact. And it's going to be the last episode in this style. So my role at Watchbox is changing moving forward. And you've already noticed that there was a three-week gap in the show when I was overseas and then sick around Halloween. The show's audience fell off because I disappeared for three weeks without any updates and without keeping the schedule, and I understand that. I'm still struggling to revive and recover the lost viewership volume on this program because I was not consistent, and YouTube hates that. So with more travel and in-person events on my horizon almost as soon as the new year passes, I won't be able to maintain this publication tempo with a show every Monday in this style. So, with new Watchbox locations coming, and there will be many of them, abroad and domestic, I'm going to be supporting them in person on a regular basis, which means traveling to the locations where I don't have this level of AV setup. I'm also going to be supporting Jack, who's new to our company, with more joint video features and the written word. I want to help him build up our editorial side. We have major plans to add muscle on that side of the company, and hopefully we'll be able to write articles that are as meaningful to you as the watches he used to cover in printed word on Hodinkee. Amid all of that, I need to keep the watch reviews current over on Watchbox Reviews because that really is what moves the metal and frankly what moves the needle in terms of views. That channel gets six times as many views as this channel and that's where I need to focus from a sales standpoint in 2023. I need to keep them reliably available even when I'm not around. I've listened hard to calls from our audience, you guys in the chat box and in the comments below these videos. You want us to revive elements of previous series such as Market Wrap and The Trading Desk. And I have to say yes to both. I love both of those features. I want to bring them back. And elements of both are going to be incorporated into what Watches Tonight is becoming. And I've looked with regret at the limited opportunities afforded by this format to engage more with you live in the chat box because why do a show at the worst possible time of day for YouTube views unless you're going to take advantage of the one thing that sets this show apart which is that it's not recorded but live streamed. I want to talk to you more during these shows and make that the focal point of the episode. So here's what's going to happen. We're going to a live talk format that will see me joined by another member of our Watchbox sales team each Monday. This could be Josh, Jason, Sequan, Armand, or Mike. All the folks you've gotten to know on this program, a second perspective is really going to help this format out. So Watches Tonight stays in this time slot. The feature is going nowhere. You can still mark your calendars. The wrist shots stay. If anything, we'll have more room for them in each episode. So instead of doing four times five wrist shots, maybe we can do six or seven times five wrist shots. The live chat and interaction between hosts and audience will become the focus, and you guys are going to drive the discussion with a lot more Q&A, because I'm going to have a second guy to answer who's more fluid and fluent in pricing than I've ever been. So that's an important perspective that the sales floor has, and I'm somewhat lacking in that regard. So, two perspectives will make a more discussion and more insights. So, two perspectives is always better than one, and you guys are the third man on the show. Plus, we'll be better able to cover breaking news and events because it'll be very off-the-cuff and fluid. So, with those changes, I'll leave the program that Josh, Jason, Sequan, Armand, or Mike can prepare and host when I'm not in the office to create these elaborate Monday structures. They can't be expected to gather all of the images and do the write-up for the creative team, but what they can do is jump on, talk, interact, and do the wrist shots. So, I'm going to be away from the office for the holidays and for the first three Mondays of the new year coming up, but the show will go on featuring other members of our Watchbox team, starting with Sequan next time around. So, that is what's coming here on Watches tonight. And I will add that you guys have always made the program, so we're going to fade to black with viewer wrist shots number four. Robert A. of Long Island, my old home, showcases his newly arrived Omega Moonwatch Silver Snoopy Award looking good with that sterling silver dial. Neil G. of Connecticut showcases his Grand Seiko Sea of Clouds with, well, a sea of clouds looking good. I love the theme shots. Again, I don't need the watch to be in focus when the background is that lovable. Eric N. of Asheville, North Carolina, admires his Rolex Datejust 41 with Sadie the German Shepherd. We love our watches and whiskers. Alejandro P. enjoys his Zenith Chronomaster Sport, purchased on vacation in Japan. 
Lucas L. of Germany sends us packing with his salmon dial Cartier Pasha C. Guys, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. All right. Mark S. is being his usual Brooklyn sourpuss self in the live chat box. I love you guys. Thanks to Sean. Thanks to you. Time out, Tim out. And thanks for logging on. <laughs>